Let's start with a simple question here. Why do we need a model of the atmosphere? Well, one good reason is because when we do flight tests, the outside conditions are ever-changing and, as it turns out, impossible to directly compare results from point to point. And still, we need, for example, to determine the cruise performance of an aircraft at any condition. So, how does the atmosphere vary anyway? Let's take this opportunity to look at some data and learn Python at the same time. And before we start, all links that I mentioned here will be in the description, so don't worry about taking note. We'll break this down into three parts. First, we'll dive directly into Python and learn how to read and plot historic uh, atmospheric sounding data. And this will take us into a journey about plotting large data sets. Then, we'll learn about the International Standard Atmosphere model that we commonly use in flight tests. And last, we'll implement this model in Python and compare it to the sounding data. And at the end, we'll have a tool at hand that will help us with data reduction all along. Three, two, one, top. Three, two, one, half. The Flight Test Engineering Channel. The most used method to do atmospheric sounding is by releasing an instrumented balloon called a radio sound, like this one we see being released on this clip from NWS Tampa. Rockets are also used, but with much, much less frequency. The radio sounds use hydrogen fill, uh, balloons that will rise up to 15,000 feet within one and a half to two hours, and the instrument will measure altitude, pressure, temperature, relative humidity, wind speed and direction, and let long and beam back the measurements via radio. As the radio sound rises, the hydrogen will expand and up to a point where the balloon skin will burst and a small parachute then reduces the terminal speed of the uh, instrument box, which is itself pretty light at more or less 250 grams. And if the instruments are found, they can be reused. Let's get some data then and try to plot it. We can get this data from the Integrated Global Radio Sound Archive hosted by NOAA. Let's jump into their site and have a look. So this is the Integrated Global Radio Sound Archive, IGRA. Let's read the preamble here. The Integrated Global Radio Sound Ar Archive consists of radio sound and pilot balloon observations from more than 2,800 globally distributed stations. The earliest data date back to 1905, and recent data become available in near real time for, from about 800 stations worldwide. Observations are available at standard and variable pressure levels, fixed and variable height wind levels, and the surface anthropopause. Variables include pressure, temperature, geopotential height, relative humidity, dew point depression, wind and speed, and elapsed time since launch. So, this is exactly what we were looking for. Now, we only have a small problem. We need to ingest this data into the computer, which is not a trivial task because the data is archived under each station with each balloon release stacked on top of each other. So, we can't plain read a CSV. Let's have a look at the file. And if we scroll down here, we see download via HTTPS. And we can click on access data. And this first directory here has data for each and every station. And if we download this first one, and now if we have a look at the uh, zipped file, let's zoom in a little bit. For this particular station, the first data collection we can see it occurred in 1947, and if we go way down to the end, the last data point is from 1993. Okay, now you can see that each balloon is stacked on top of each other, each release, balloon release. And how are we going to import this data? Obviously, and Excel won't cut it, and we'll need to parse this file. But this is the beauty with the Python ecosystem. This data is consumed by a ton of people, and the odds that someone already created a parser are really high. So instead of writing one ourselves, let's grab a ready-made one. If you search on Google, you'll find a few options. 
but I selected this one because it is simple. Let's jump back into our browser here. And if we go to the other tab, you see that this is the project description, IGRA. This Python 3 module is intended to read IGRA v2 and CDC data for to pandas, data frames, or X array data sets. And we'll need to install it in our environment. But before we do that, just a reminder that all code that we develop here is available in our channel's GitHub repository. HTTPS github.com flight test engineering. This link will also be in the video description below. Let's jump into Jupyter and install this library. To install this library, we just follow the instructions given here on the project's page, uh, PyPI page, which will be pip install igra. So if we jump back to our, to our tab here and we open up a new prompt, we can just say pip install igra and it will grab the library from the repository and will install all of the dependencies here on our, on our uh, environment. And we're ready to go. Now we are ready to jump into Jupyter and start plotting this. Now we need to select the station we want to plot. And there's a station inventory here. We can look up, for example, Edwards Air Force Base. If we come down here and find the station inventory file, we click, if we zoom in a little bit and then do a control F, we put Edwards, there you go. You have this code USM 00072381, which is what we're going to use to download the data from NOAA servers. So if we just go back to our Jupyter notebook here, To use this library, it is really simple. We start with the preamble by importing pandas, numpy, and matplotlib, which is our plotting library. And then we also import the library that we just installed, igra. Okay, so we run this. We then just create a one constant here to, for conversion factors, meters to feet. Let's run this. And now we first download the station we want, in this case, Edwards Air Force Base, and we place the text file into our local directory. This is a command that is from the IGRA library that we just installed. So if we run this, you see that uh, the library is going to go and fetch the data directly from NOAA.gov servers. And it's going to place it on our local directory. Next up, we need to read back this file into a pandas data frame. And this is where the magic parsing of the file will happen. And with one command, we then have access to what we wanted in the first place. So let's run this. Let the library do the heavy lifting of parsing the data for us. And we we are now four notebook cells in, and we already have the data. Uh, like I said, this is one of the most powerful features in the Python ecosystem, not just the language itself, but since it is widely used for science, there are many, many libraries that allow you to move fast. In this case, let's look at the data by doing a data.head. Now we're working on a pandas data frame. And we can see here that we have dates as our index, and then the variables, pressure, geopotential potential height, temperature, relative humidity, um, DPD, I don't remember, wind direction, and wind speed. In this case, all of these data are non-existent for the 1942 balloon launch that we have here. All, all they measured was wind direction and wind speed. And we can see that we have a giant vector with a few variables uh, against the index, which is dates, like I said. How many data points do we have exactly? Let's try to see here by doing our length. Oh man, almost a million data points. 
And going back to our main objective here, we want to plot pressure and temperature versus altitude. So let's try a pressure plot first. We're going to do a plot scatter of pressure against uh, geopotential height. And notice that we're putting pressure on the x-axis and geopotential height, GPH, on the vertical axis because that shows you a profile of the atmosphere. We have a plot here, but uh, boy, oh boy, that is ugly. We can see that the markers are too large for so many points. Also, a grid would help us, so let's improve this a little bit. We're going to improve this, improve this graph by plotting the same thing, pressure versus geopotential height, but now we're going to set the marker size to 0.05 and we're going to tell Matplotlib to use just a pixel, a, a dot as a marker. And C here means that we're going to set the color to this hex value. The next line tells Matplotlib to turn on the grid, but the lines should use an alpha of 0 0.2, which means that they're going to um, be less, less bright. So let's run this. Okay, that looks much better, and we can see that the pressure does not vary a lot along the years, does it? I mean, of course there's a variation, that is why the line looks thick, but the plotting, we're plotting data from 1940 to the 20, to 2020s, and we're still exploring the data with a crude graph, but notice that we have conveniently placed the geopotential height on the vertical axis, giving us the pressure variation on the vertical profile, like I said before. So this is neat. Let's look at the temperature then. And to do a temperature plot, well, we're going to still use a scatter plot of temperature now versus geopotential height with the same marker size 0 0.05, same marker, same color, same grid. And we're adding here the X label to the X graphics, uh, X axis, temperature in C, and the Y label as our geopotential height in meters. So let's run this to see what we get. Yeah, a lot, this is a lot more variation, which makes sense. Um, and this is an opportunity to learn about plotting large data sets like this one. You see, we have a few problems here that may lead to misinterpretation. And to enforce what I said before, there's a lot of smart people using Python, and we can piggyback directly into this knowledge. And in this case, let's look at the plotting pitfalls as described by a library driven by the community called Data Shader. Looking at the data shader, frequently asked questions. Uh, the first one is, when should I use data shader? Data shader is designed for working with large data sets for cases where it's most crucial to faithfully represent the distribution of your data, which is exactly what we have here, because we have a huge data set for pressures and temperatures along the geopotential heights, and this distributed along time many, many years, and we want to see how this is distributed, how this varies a long time. And we have to bear in mind that the people that wrote Data Shader, they have a lot of experience plotting large data sets, and they also wrote an article with the pain points that they have found out, with the pitfalls that they have found out when working with large data sets, and that's what we're going to have a look here. Plotting pitfalls. The common pitfalls that they are listing here are first, overplotting, where occlusion of data by other data, which is also called overdrawing. This occurs whenever a data point or curve is plotted on top of another data point or curve and is a problem just not for scatter plots as here, but for curve plots, 3D plots, bar graphs, and any other plots that can have data ob obscured. And one way to fix this is with alpha, by thinking that points that overlap look brighter. This is going to lead to oversaturation, where when you use alpha to some overlaps, the problem here is that if you set alpha to 0.1, for example, there can only be 10 points that can overlap until we reach saturation. So for almost a billion points, we'll surely reach oversaturation and lose information. 
And then you might even think, well, easy, just plot less points, right? This leads us to undersampling, where you might be missing out as well by not seeing something important that is not being included in the plot. And the next solution is to use maybe heat maps, which are basically 2D histograms. Each bucket then gets plotted with a color with the aggregate of points. Um, however, this may lead to undersaturation. And the problem with this is that if there aren't any, uh, enough points in the bucket, then there will be nothing to show. And this is more pronounced if the data is spread out and the graph looks just gray with no apparent structures. Uh, and a solution then may be adding an offset to bring back the low buckets, low count buckets into view. And this leads to underutilized range, um, where the problems now start to be very subtle. Differences in the data points then are not visible because all or nearly all pixels get mapped either to the bottom, meaning light gray, or to the top, black. Uh, and to counter this, we can map colors differently then, using, for example, a logarithmic, logarithmic scale. But this is arbitrary, and a more structured approach could be to just use a non-uniform color map, where each color um, is a bucket with the same amount of data. And this is called the uni non-uniform color mapping. Now that we know about data shader and the pitfalls about plotting large data sets like this one, let's install the libraries in our environment and start using it. We will need these three libraries, hollow views, hvplot, and data shader. So let's go ahead and install those by opening a terminal and doing pip install hvplot, that's the first one, we need also data shader and hollow views, so let's wait for this one, hollow views is installed, and now we need data shader, pip install data shader. Okay, it's fetching the libraries, it's installed in our environment. And before we can use this, after it's installed, we'll have to restart our kernel. So let's go back to our no notebook and we can say that we have kernel, restart kernel and clear all outputs. And we can run up to here. So run all above selected cells. We can see the status here that it's running and we have to wait for it to download the data again and reload that. And there you go. We have already the same status that we had before. So the first thing we're going to do is import the libraries that we installed. hvplot.pandas, hollow views as hv, and then color set. Color set will give us the last um, item that we saw in our pitfalls, which is a non-uniform color, color set right? Then we set the extension to plot using the uh, bokeh format and then from bokeh themes we import the built-in themes to set it to dark minimal just so it matches my Jupyter notebook here. And here is, go is, is the first plot that we're going to do. Data hvplot scatter. So it's the same idea that we had before and we're going to plot temperature on the x-axis versus geopotential height on the y-axis. We're going to ask it to rasterize true because then the graph is faster. Color norm, remember we talked about logarithm, so we're gonna use that. We're not gonna plot a color bar as our, as our scale here. The x label is gonna be temperature in, in degree C, y label geopotential height in meters. We're going to plot a grid and we're going to use the color map as the color set CBC. And then we're going to also set the Y limit to 40,000 meters. So let's see what this does. 
it takes a little bit because now it's plotting everything. Oh, so this is much nicer than we had before. And we can see the variation of the data as time goes by. We can see, for example, that we have some strata here that data was collected. Uh, remember, this is temperature versus geopotential height here. So we can see that at certain altitudes, at certain geopotential heights, they always took temperature. And in between bands, they didn't so much. But you can see from the thickness of these lines here that there are many less data points on the extremes <coughs> and much more in the middle, which is to expect since this is a, a band of variation. You can see that it's lighter in the middle than in the extremes. Last thing I want to touch base is that so far we have insight as to how the atmosphere varies with time for one location. So for this last part, let's create a graph with three different locations around the globe to see how the atmosphere will vary from location to location. So we're going to create a data set here, which is a set in Python. And we already have AdWords, but let's keep it complete and the order relates to the altitude here. So we're going to take Fairbanks, AdWords, which we already have, and then Florianopolis in Brazil. We're going to take these three stations. So for each station and station ID in stations items, so for each station and station ID in this set here, we're going to do data and we're going to ignore the station name is going to be IGRA read ASCII to data frame that station ID, right? And then the data set for that station is going to be the data that we just read. So if we do this, we're going to get a data set with three stations. Each station has its own uh, station ID, right? And we will be able to access this data set by stating which station ID we want to get. You see, it takes a little bit of time because it, it's fairly large data sets for each of the stations. So it's loading everything into memory. And while it's loading, we can take a look at the next cell here. So we say, and it's, it's finished loading, right? We can say that our starting year is going to be 1940, 1st of May, and our ending year is going to be 2020, 1st of September. And we're going to create here figure and axes are going to be subplots, two by three, with a shared X axis and a shared Y axis. The, col the column ID axis is the variable that will iterate between columns. So for each station and data in the data set that we just created, right there, we're going to create our filtered data. It's going to be our data where the index is higher or uh, yeah, higher than the uh, starting year and the index is less than the ending year. And we're going to get temperature, pressure, and geopotential height. Okay, um, we can go to the end here. We are also going to drop everything that is not a number. So this function here in pandas cleans up the data to show only whatever data you have real numbers. So first our data label is going to be pressure and we're going to create first the pressure plots. So our X data is going to be whatever filter data we have for pressure, because our data label is pressure, divided by 1000 to give us in kilopascals. And our Y data is going to be whatever filter data we had, but now we want the geopotential height, and instead of meters, we want feet. But we're going to divide by 1000 to get thousands of feet, because it makes more sense in this, this uh, instance. So our X is zero, and then color, column index, is going to create a scatter plot with x and y data with the same sets that we have, same setup that we had before. The size of the marker is going to be 0.05, the marker is going to be just a, a dot with that color, and alpha is going to be 0 
it's going to set the grid to visible with an alpha 0.2 and it's going to set the title to the station. And if the column um, index is zero, then it's going to set the X label to whatever label, data label we have in kilopascals. It's going to set the coordinates of the data label for the X axis and it's going to set the Y label for the Y axis geopotential height in kilofeet. And then we're going to proceed and plot the temperature. So we change our data label to temperature. We change the X data to whatever filter data we had, but now with the label temperature. The Y label is the same. And now we are plotting axis one and then column index. Same idea. The scatter plot of X data, Y data. And then the column uh, index, we, um, we set the grid visible. And if the column index is zero, we set the labels. We increment the column uh, index plus one, and we go through the next station, okay? And then at the end, we show everything. So if we run this, we're using matplotlib here, so we're not going to see uh, the beautiful plot we had on the data shader, but that's okay. We already understand. Let me zoom out just a little bit so it fits. So we have Fairbanks, Edwards, and Florianopolis. This is the pressures uh, graph. You can see it's yeah, fairly similar. The scales are the same here on the y-axis. And this is the temperature graphs. So you can see that Fairbanks has a very, very, very large variation. While Florianopolis, for example, which is more a tropical place, has much less variation. With this, we come to the end of the first video. I encourage you to explore libraries for plotting large data sets like hollow views and data shader that we saw here. There are frequent updates and also other options. In video two of this mini-series, we'll derive the equations for the standard atmosphere. See you there!